Well, I am, I'm up here debating. I know we're going to have Brother Wayne Pugh with us next Sunday morning. And I'm just, while I'm standing up here, I'm thinking, should I, should I move on and, or should I wait until I get a consistency of weeks with Matthew 24? And, uh, and so I'm, I'm thinking about, uh, all right, I'm going a different direction. <clears throat> you know that this is Pentecost Sunday. Amen. Did you know that? What does the word Pentecost actually mean? Anybody know? Pentecost means thank you? Okay, yeah, it, okay. But it actually means 50. It's 50 days after what, Mike? No wonder you had to be a believer. You're not a good Jew. <laughs> <laughs> 50 days after the Passover yes sir I, I'm, just, I'm just teasing you Mike forgive me man I shouldn't shouldn't talk like that no. so today is Pentecost Sunday so I what we're going to do is I'm just going to do a little journey here and, uh, and uh, you would go with me to Isaiah the 28th chapter I don't even know where this is going to go, and that's always somewhat dangerous, at least for me. 28th chapter, uh, we'll start with verse number 9. <clears throat> so, Sister Ginger, you just got to hang out with us today, or as we say, we're winging it today, and so that means, well, it means, whatever it's going to mean. So... Uh, who, who, will, who will, whom will he teach knowledge, and, and whom will he make to understand the message? Those just weaned from milk, those just drawn from the breast. And then he says, for precept must be upon precept, upon precept, line upon line, line upon line. Here a little, and, and there a little. And then he says in verse 11, for with stammering lips and another tongue, he will speak to this people. To whom he said, this is the rest with which you may cause the weary to rest. And this is the refreshing. Yet uh, they would not hear. Amen. Amen. So we're going we're gonna to start here this morning. And uh, just, uh, now this, this is a prophetic scripture here. Many times scriptures have a near and a far meaning. There's a near meaning, and then there's one afar that's way down the road. Uh, I have heard people argue from this portion of scripture that, of course, this is referring to the Assyrians, which is true. The Assyrians are fixing to come into Israel, the northern kingdom, and take it captivity. And, of course, they speak a language that uh, that the he the Hebrews do not speak, and so their words are going to sound uh, not very uh, un not understandable. So it says, "With stammering lips, another tongue." Now that that I believe is the near meaning. Okay, now, uh, <clears throat> well, if you would go with me to to the fourteenth chapter of Corinthians right now. Just let me just feel my way through this. Uh, uh, First Corinthians, brother. Good, good question. Fourteenth chapter of Corinthians. Okay, uh, we're going to start with verse twenty in just a minute here. Now, <clears throat> for you to understand this portion of scripture, you got to understand. Well, you know, let's let's back up to chapter twelve. Okay. Let's go to verse 13. Okay, 12, 13. And then we'll move over to the 14th chapter. Okay. Uh, it says this, For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one Spirit. All right, y'all get that. Okay, now, let me ask you, 
where you've ever read a terminology that is similar to what you just read. It just, in fact, the, the last part of the verse, really, and yet you've all been made to drink into one spirit. Where, where, where else in the Bible has it ever referred to the spirit as, as you would refer? Uh, I'm trying to keep from saying the word. Uh, water, I'm going to say. Might as well say it. All right, John chapter 7, verse 37 through 39, correct. Uh, but in John 4, in fact, let's, let's go there for just a minute. This, I guess I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get back to the 14th chapter here. Uh, John 4, verse 10. Let's go to 410. Amen. And, uh, because Jesus is talking to the, the woman at the well. And uh, she is, of course, said, you're a Jew. And amen, we don't have any dealings, that kind of thing. And Jesus says to her in verse 10, if you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked of him and he would have given you living water. Okay, verse 11. The woman said to him, sir, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where then do you get that living water? Verse 12. Amen. Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well, drank from it himself, and as well as his sons and his livestock? Verse 14. Amen. Springing into everyone. Okay. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst, but the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing into everlasting life. So now, I ask you again. Uh, what is Paul then referring to in the 14th chapter of Corinthians, okay? Or the 12th chapter in verse number 13 when he says all have been made to drink into one spirit. What is he talking about here? He's talking about the Holy Ghost, okay? We, we didn't read to you John 7, uh, 30, uh, 7 through 39. Uh, because in there, I mean, well, you know what, let's read it. I got all day. <laughs> you know, I have a sense of humor. All right. John seven thirty. Let's go back to verse 37. <clears throat> On the last day of the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. That's, I'm quoting King James. That's not King James. That's New King James. Next verse. He who believes in me, as the scripture said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water and then of course verse 39 but this he spoke concerning the spirit who those believing in him would receive for the spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified now okay so what John is or what Paul's talking about there he's talking he is talking about the baptism of the Holy Ghost and he's referring to it as drinking the spirit which we do you know, that the spirit is much like water. It gives life. You can't go long without water. You may last, what, three days. Then you get, you get extremely dehydrated. You get delusional. You get almost in a, a state of a coma. And then eventually you would just pass away. You got to have water to survive. Amen. That's why if you're a study of ancient history, cities and villages were always located close to a source of water amen because people need water and so when you read in chapter 12 of Corinthians amen and he talks about the gifts of the spirit he, he makes a reference again here to they're all baptized into one spirit now uh, you see hang out with me here uh, <clears throat> It is from this portion of scripture that many in the church world uh, take uh, the aspect of speaking in tongues and uh, talk of it uh, and emphasize it over the gift of the Holy Ghost. Uh, I don't, uh, that, that's, that in itself is not truth. Uh, amen. Again, we're not spending time just speaking, talking about tongues here. But uh, the tongues that it's referring to here in chapter 12 is one of the aspects of God's spirit. And there are nine gifts that are listed here in chapter 12. But all of them have been filled with the spirit 
They've all drank. And, and I would suggest that this would be a good day to drink. <laughs> amen, amen. Uh, that, that we really don't need any teetotalers here. You know what a teetotaler is? You know, I go to Olive Garden and, and they always come around and they want you to have a little bit of wine, you know. And I, I can quote to the scripture a little wine for the stomach's sake. And, you know, like, and, the, and the doctor says a little red wine is good for the heart. But I, but I tell them that uh, I'm a teetotaler, which means that I don't drink. Okay, I don't drink any form of alcoholic beverage. I just don't do that. Amen. And, uh, but I, I'm going to encourage you to drink today. All right. <laughs> I'm going to encourage you to drink of the Spirit of God. You know, that's what, that's what he's telling them. You all have been... You've all been baptized into one body, in one spirit. All have been made to drink, you know. And so, amen, I, I think we need to drink today. All of us in the room. I think we need to drink with God's spirit. Uh, in fact, uh, I would suggest that if you drink of the spirit, it'll just change your entire outlook. I, like I said, I'm, you know, I'm just shooting from the hip today. So I'm winging it. So God only knows where this is all going to go. You know, so, <clears throat> Yeah. I think if you get enough of the Holy Ghost, it changes even how you look at people. People that you didn't look at too, you know, too well, or at least you know, a little jaundiced eye towards them because of their behavior. And, and some of us, we, we deal with problems. I mean, we live in a problemed world. We live in a sin-cursed world. And so I would suggest to you, if you, you want to you wanna really have joy and, and make it through this life, you need to drink. <laughs> Really? Of the waters of salvation. You know, some of us get pretty parched. You know, and probably forget how to drink. Yeah, you know, I don't want to ever forget how to drink. Oh my. Yeah. Praise God. You're God. I I pastor and you know, you understand from this viewpoint back that direction. Uh, it looks like a lot of people need to drink sometimes. <laughs> it really does. <laughs> oh my. Now, I would suggest that, that if we would be filled with the Spirit of God, that we would uh, be able to look at things from a different light. Amen. Uh, you know how a drunk man is. You know, when, he, when he's drunk, there, there ain't no big boys in the bar. I mean, the big boys are reduced to small boys, you know, and he can lick anybody in the bar, you know, and, and okay, this is going to get me in trouble. Every woman looks beautiful. I know that's going to get me in trouble. You know, I'm just, I'm just telling you, it just changes your perception and how you address things. I'm telling you that if we are filled with the Holy Ghost and if we're drinking of God, it's going to change our perception. It's when, it's when I'm teetotaling that I got issues. You know, a drunk man can fall over and laugh. You know, I was many years ago riding down 52nd Street. It was late at night with my wife. And a bunch of guys came out of one of the bars over in 52nd Street. It was just a bunch of bikers in uh, the big bikes, not, not, not Hondas and Suzukis and Yamahas. These were the big ones, Harley Davidson, and that kind of stuff. And uh, they, uh, they get on their bikes, you know, and I'm following. And there's one guy that gets on the bike, and, and I know he's having problems, okay? And so I follow him. We got to 30th Street, 30th, 52nd. We're going west. And I, I, I'm, I think I'm supposed to turn somewhere in there, but, but I, I'm not turning because when he got to 52nd Street and 30th, well, he was, he was on 52nd and 30th, and, that, and he got the red light, I mean, when he stopped, whatever ability to balance himself was not there because he put that bike down on the ground. Not hard, just down. And, and uh, I said, wow. And then he struggles to get it up. And, they move on down. I think the next stoplight was 39th or somewhere in there. Same thing happens at 39th. He just couldn't keep it. I'm thinking to myself, my God, these guys better get him off his bike or he's going to get himself killed. Amen. So, I, 
But, but, uh, but they were all laughing because it was funny to them. I, I would suggest to you, amen, that what, what our world needs to see are believers that are consistent, amen, filled with the joy of the Holy Ghost, praise God, and, and in spite of the things that they got to deal with, and, and we're not disregarding that in any way, that we all deal with stuff. So the next time you come to me and you got an issue and you want me to address it, I, mean, I, I think I'm just going to tell you, well, you just need to drink. Yeah, that, that's pretty easy. Can't just drink. All right, I, I beat that up enough. I better, I better move on. All right, let's go back to chapter 14. Amen. So the reason I had us read that verse is the believers at Corinth, they were filled with the, with the Holy Ghost. They had drank of the waters. In fact, I tell you, go back to 14. Let's jump over to uh, chapter 1 real quick. Sorry. Sorry, Ginger, this, like I said, we are, uh, let's see, all right, all right, uh, verse 4, let's, let's go to verse 4, chapter 1, verse 4, I, I thank my God always concerning you for the grace of God which is given to you by Christ Jesus, that you were enriched in everything by him in the all utterance and all knowledge, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you so that you you come short in no gift okay eagerly awaiting for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ okay so amen he, he's telling these believers, you, you're not coming short in any, any of the gifts okay now they had already received the gift of the Holy Ghost and so what he's referring to here is what we read in chapter 12 of Corinthians when he refers to the 12 gifts now let's get back on the subject Chapter 14, this is the subject. Chapter 14, verse 20, are you still with me? Have I lost you somewhere and all this stuff I've been, are you still, are you caught back there at the drinking part? <laughs> all right, all right, all right, all right. Brethren, do not be children in understanding, however in malice be babes, but in understanding be mature. Okay. And then he says in the law it is written. With men of other tongues and other lips, I will speak to this people. And after all that, they will not hear me, says the Lord. Amen. Now, this is, we've already read this in Isaiah 28. Okay. Now, <clears throat> therefore, he says, tongues are a sign not to those who believe, but to the unbeliever. But prophecy is not for unbelievers, but for those who believe. Now, I've read all that to say, okay. There's, there's indication through the word of God that uh, the spirit of God moves in very powerful ways uh, before judgment comes, all right? Very powerful ways. We read back in, in Isaiah this morning, stand my lips on their tongues and will he speak to his people? And then it says, yet they will not hear. Uh, what was coming to Israel was the judgment of Assyria. It was, it was a God-ordained judgment on them for their wickedness and their turning away. Amen. And so, tying that with... Well, let, let's go back to Isaiah 28, 12. Uh, for me to <clears throat> say then, as I've had some say to me, that this, has, this is not any relationship to speaking in tongues uh, let me just read this verse to you to whom he said this is the rest with which you may cause the weary to rest and this is the refreshing yet they would not hear now let me ask you a question is warfare refreshing it, it is not uh, again I'm uh, I, I study and read about in fact, I just read about Normandy, pretty dry book about uh, the process and decisions that were made and the different generals and the end bickering and all that kind of stuff that goes on behind the scenes that the guy down there, the grunt, doesn't hear about. He just has to obey the order. But uh, warfare is not refreshing. So <clears throat> when you take these verse 11 and verse 12, and some would say to you, that this has no relationship with speaking in tongues. Uh, verse 12 talks about a refreshing. All right. Now, jump with me to chapter 3 of Acts. 
Peter is preaching to, to a Jewish audience. Let's go down here to verse number 19. And he says to them, this Jewish audience, you repent therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out so that the times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. Now I'm telling you, the refreshing he's talking about there is the baptism of the Holy Ghost. In fact, the word refreshing is only used twice in the scripture, at least in the Bibles I use. It's used in Isaiah 28, 12, and here in Acts 3, 19. Amen. So again, the apostle Peter was referring to when a person repents, he is going to, again, be refreshed when he's filled with the Holy Ghost. You, you know what I'm talking about this morning? About being refreshed in the Holy Ghost? Amen. It just, amen. In fact, Titus tells us, I think it's chapter 3, verse 5, we're, we're saved uh, by the renewing of his presence, his spirit. Praise God. There's a continual need of refreshing. Amen. You, you understand that? I'm concerned when some people have a, a, a minor experience, if I could call it, I shouldn't actually use the word minor. You know, they spoke in tongues, and, and that's the last time they ever do it. You know, I, I think they need to go back to the well. Because it does say, with joy shall we draw waters from the wells of salvation. And, and I would suggest that we need to go there quite often. In fact, I'll go as far as say, it'd be good to go there every day. My God. Really? All right, all right. But in Isaiah 28, these languages that were spoken by the Assyrians was an indication of soon coming judgment to Israel. Now, let's go back to Acts 2. The Holy Ghost is outpoured. Okay, and there was quite a crowd of Jews. They have come to celebrate. They have come to worship. They have come, I am in, for the Feast of Pentecost. And uh, they have seen one of the most different situations they've ever seen in their life. Never seen anything like it before. They, probably many of them may have heard the wind. Because it speaks of the Russian mighty wind. I'm not sure they saw the cloven tongues of fire as it sat upon each and every one of them. But they did hear them speak. And many of these Jews that were there were coming. They were from the dispersia. They had been dispersed throughout all the Mediterranean area. And so they, they had been for generations in other lands, but they were still very Jewish, kept their Judaism, amen. And so they came to Jerusalem to celebrate because you know what? A male was required to come to Jerusalem three times a year for the feast. And so they had come to celebrate, amen, the feast of Pentecost and they saw this, this outpouring uh, they had never seen before. And this, this is a people that has a history of God doing magnificent things. And, uh, and of course, if we took the time in the scripture, uh, we would uh, say uh, that there was those that doubted, those, there's those that were amazed, there are those that were confused. And then there was a group of mockers. So in Acts 2 and 4, Peter stands up with 11 and he begins to preach to them. He asks them to listen. Verse 15, I think would be a good place for these are not drunk, as you suppose. See, see, I'm not whacked, folks. My brother Peter was preaching and he said they're not drunk like, like you think. He didn't say they were they're not drunk. He just said, they're not drunk like you think. So I suspect they're acting like drunk men act. I mean, they started on chairs because they were all sitting. I don't know if someone was on the floor. Some got up, started staggering around. I, I, I don't know. Wasn't there. But, but there was people mocking, saying they're drunk. So obviously, uh, there was quite a commotion going on. Now, verse 17. 
and it shall come to pass in the last day, says God, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters which shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my manservants and on my maidservants I will pour out my spirit in those days and they shall prophesy. All right. You stop there just for a moment. So what, what Peter was saying is, this, is this is a fulfillment of the prophecy spoken by Joel in chapter 2, verse 28. Okay, but he doesn't stop with the outpouring of the Holy Ghost. But he goes on and he says, I will show you wonders in the heaven above and signs in the earth beneath and blood and fire and a vapor of smoke and the sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the, before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Whoever has that name called over them. Is that's what that word call means to invoke. Amen. The name of the Lord shall be saved. Now you may not see this. Okay. But you, there are really two phases that, that Joel's talking about here. And it, it, is, it is a time clock that started clicking. Or ticking. Back in Acts. A time clock to the end. All right. And the time clock began when it said, In the last days, saith the Lord, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. And we know that was the baptism of the Holy Ghost. But then you get over to verse 19, and it says, I will show you wonders in heaven above and signs on earth beneath. Now, I've been studying in Matthew 24, and it's led me to numerous other scriptures that speak of what, what Joel's talking about here. And every one of them, Amen. It gives reference to the coming of the Lord. Not coming for his saints, but coming to judge the world. All right. So let me say it again to you this morning in this room. That before God judges, he first moves in miraculous and mighty ways. To get people to come to him. And that so... What happened in Acts chapter 2, somewhere around 33 AD, somewhere in that vicinity, give or take whatever calendar you use, when the Holy Ghost was outpoured, let's just say it was, it was 30 AD. Uh, I'm not sure, because some say Christ was born 4, 4 BC, so somewhere in there. 40 years later, Jerusalem would be leveled 40 years later. So what came after the outpouring of God's Spirit was judgment. All right. Now, we can take you back to Isaiah 28 again, and there's going to be a people that they could not understand their language, and they were bringing judgment on Israel. Now, just hang out with me, because I'm going somewhere with this. So, in 1900, on January 1st, a lady in, in was it Topeka, Kansas? They had been studying. They had been, in fact, they were on their time of, <clears throat> of vacation. They were going to this school. Uh, what was the name of the teacher? I can't even think of his name right now. It'll come to me. Yeah, yes, that's right. Uh, and uh, they had studied, what is the evidence that I haven't received the Holy Ghost? And so that, that had been their research or what they were supposed to, that was their assignment. And so they had all come to a conclusion that the evidence was speaking with other tongues. And on January 1st, a lady received the baptism of the Holy Ghost and it soon... Others followed, okay. And it began to spread. It went from Topeka. It was in Houston. And then out in Los Angeles. Amen. And uh, amen. God poured out His Spirit. Many people came from many different denominations to inquire what was going on. And many of them received the baptism of the Holy Ghost there. And there was miracles and just signs and wonders that took place. Okay. 1906. Uh, 
1916, 1914, World War One began. We didn't get involved until 1917. In 1939, World War II began, and uh, we didn't get involved until 41, at least, uh, with uh, actually fighting. Uh, all these are forms of judgment that come. What God is doing in these last days is he's pouring out his spirit. And to the believer this morning, we ought to have the understanding that when God does these things, down the road, judgment's coming. Down the road. And uh, so, Pastor, why are you mentioning this this morning? Well, we, it means that what I'm going to do for Jesus, I need to do. Uh, getting close to him, that's what I need to do. I need to impact as many people as I can before he comes, before judgment comes. So these are indications, ladies and gentlemen. God has always, always had a witness before he brought judgment. And in fact, we get into Matthew 24, we will actually uh, point out to you the 144,000 and that they would become a witness in Revelation along with the, what we know as the two witnesses. Uh, so, I'm saying these things this morning. We are celebrating Pentecost. But I understand the other side of Pentecost. The judgment is coming rapidly on its heels. Now I know we've had 2,000 years almost since the Holy Ghost fell. I know. I know. But judgment is coming to this planet, to this nation. Amen. To this nation. I, this is just me now. You don't have to agree with me. I believe the United States is past the point of ever completely coming back to God. All right. Now hear me. That doesn't mean that we can't have great revival in America. All right, uh, I'm, not, I'm not excluding that by no means. But I believe, you see, there's a tipping point. There was a time in Israel when God said, I have had long suffering with you, I have been patient with you, I have forgiven you over and over again, and you have turned your back on me. And Jeremiah, the weeping prophet, would be preaching a message that nobody else was preaching. All the other preachers were saying, peace, peace, peace. Not Jeremiah. He basically was telling them, judgment's coming. And there's not anything you can do. To, because God gets to a point where he's going to judge. Let me, let, me, let me reinforce that with scripture. The 15th chapter of Genesis. Verse number 15, 14. 15, 14. I'm saying these things today that help us to get close to God. Uh... Okay, and also the nation, back up to the 13th verse. Let me start. Then he said to Abram, Know certainly that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs, and will serve them, and they will afflict them for 400 years. And also the nation whom they serve, I will judge. And afterward they shall come out with great possessions. Now, if you know anything about that, when he judged Egypt, he, he, bitter, he literally, he destroyed its economy, destroyed it, destroyed its ability to fight other nations at that time. In fact, I am not sure in history that they ever, ever rose to the place that they had been to after God judged them. Verse, verse 15. Now, as for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You should be buried at a good, age, a good old age. Verse 16. But in the fourth generation, they shall return here. Okay, the here he's referring to is Canaan. For the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. Okay, in the King James, it says it's not yet full. All right, verse 16. 
And it should come to pass. Okay, I'm sorry, that's, that's far enough. We don't have to read verse 17. So, <clears throat> God, God does have a place where he says, it's enough. When he closed the door of the ark, when God closed the door of the ark, it was over. Amen. So, we're here today. We're going to rejoice. We've been filled with the Spirit. God didn't give you his Spirit just for you to get goosebumps and feel good on Sunday. And may I say also to you this morning that just because you speak in tongues today, amen, that's not where you stop. Because God's word demands obedience. All right. All right. What, what we have, a, I'm just talking to you right now. I'm just talking. Just talking. Uh, what, we, what has happened to many at Pentecostals is we have learned to come into a service and submit to the presence of God. And when we submit to the presence of God in the service, we'll speak in tongues. And we'll use that as a barometer that I'm a-okay. You understand? I mean, it, it happens a lot. But yet the same person that yielded to the Spirit of God in here will walk out there and cuss somebody else out out there because of some situation that unfolded and I submit to you that going out the door they were not in the spirit when they begin to cuss somebody out and so to use that as a barometer that I'm okay with God you're okay with God when you are producing fruit and fruit comes from obedience to God all right, now, man, I'm just sort of cut, touching a bunch of stuff right now. So in this last day, we need to obey God. We need to walk in the Spirit. Amen. The people that tell me they can't help themselves, they ain't walking in the Spirit. <laughs> Praise God. Hallelujah. Why are you saying this? Because... Judgment's coming, ladies and gentlemen. It's coming. You can't withhold it with your prayer. But you can help to save somebody. You can help to disciple somebody to God. Really? Amen. This is the hour that if you were ever going to do anything for God, this is the hour to do something for God. This is the hour to get as close to the mass as you possibly can get. This is the hour to follow him 24-7. Amen. Listening to the Spirit of God. If you are spiritual, amen, you will listen and obey the Spirit of God. Spirituality has nothing to do with church attendance, paying your tithes, amen, which are all things we should do, amen. It has everything to do with following the leading of the spirit of the living God. Amen. Hallelujah. Man. My God. Why are you getting worked up preacher? Because judgment's coming. I prayed this morning. That my grandsons would be filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. To my knowledge they don't have it. I got little, littler ones. I got a Shiloh and I got a Sadie. And one's three, three years old. The other one's just three months old. Four months old. My wife she's got to help me understand. And uh, I pray for those little ones that, God, you give them a desire for you. You stir their little hearts. You move. I, I realize and I fully understand that, amen, their awareness of God is, is not like your awareness and my awareness. But uh, God, I want you to move on their hearts. I, I want, man, let, let them love come into the house of God. Let them love worshiping you. Let them love your word and let them love the preaching and the teaching of the word of God. Let it, let it be instilled in them when they're young, not when they're old. Because I would submit to you, ladies and gentlemen, if you're waiting for your kids to become older teenagers, amen, there's going to be a group of people here when God comes that are small. There were babies in the time of the flood. And so... What had happened in 1900, 1906, 
that time period, that moving of God's spirit was just the clock's ticking. Judgment's coming. Let's live for God. Let's follow God with all our hearts. Amen. Let's not just be Christians that show up to church on Sunday and then have a, another life when we walk out the door. You know, and just slip the code on and off when you come into this house. See, we, we're not like that, Pastor. Oh, don't lie to me. There are a number of us that are like that in this house. Amen. You slip your Christianity on and off when you walk out the door. And then you have all kinds of excuses. Throw your excuses away. Well, Pastor, you don't understand what I'm dealing with. I may not understand what I'm dealing with, but I've got the same Holy Ghost you've got. And I've had my, I've had my series of trials and troubles, and, and I've got to fight stuff just like you've got to fight stuff. If you think I'm free from fighting stuff, you're crazy. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. <laughs> I probably should have gone to Matthew 24, Sister Ginger. <laughs> I'd have probably been better off going there than where I'm at today. But my heart has got stirred today. I want my heart to be stirred. Praise God. Let's go to, let's go to, let's go to Jude. I, I'm mindful of my time, and my time is about gone. Help me, Jesus. Let's go to Jude. Which is only one chapter. Verse 20. But you beloved, he says, building yourself up on your most holy faith. And look what he says next. What's he say next? Praying in the Holy Spirit. Now, I, I know that in the 14th chapter of Corinthians, Paul said, I, I pray with an understanding and I pray without an understanding. And he said the same about singing. All right. So I know, I, I know fully aware that there are times when I'm praying in English that I'm praying in the Holy Spirit. Because the words flowing out of me, they just ain't my words. But I also would suggest to you that praying in the Holy Spirit is giving yourself to God and drinking of the Spirit and drinking of the Spirit and speaking in other tongues as God's Spirit gives the utterance. I don't want time to go there, but the 14th chapter says that it edifies you. Amen. Again, I'm, I'm not talking about the corporate body right now. Because that's what the 14th chapter deals with, the corporate body, worship the entire body together, where it gets into tongues and, in, and the interpretation and all that business. Amen. But I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, we need to get in the Spirit. We need to get in the Spirit. Yeah. Uh, we really do. We really do. Hallelujah. I'm telling you, God, God will help you. Amen. God's grace, Melanie, is sufficient for everything that we deal with. And some things are not nice things, and some things are ugly things. But I'm telling you, praying in the Spirit, amen, will strengthen you. God's grace will be upon you, even though your life is scarred from whatever situation you're dealing with. Praying in the Holy Ghost. Then it says, keeping yourself in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. How do you keep yourself in the love of God? Well, obviously it's by faith. Uh, but uh, if you love me, he says, you'll keep my commandments. So that's an indication of keeping yourself in the love of God is keeping his commandments. Amen. And his commandments are not grievous. Amen. And I, I believe that, you know, yeah, we have the written commandments. But what about the times that God has tried to get you to talk to somebody? get you to do something and you rejected it. Amen. I believe that we can literally reject the working of God's Spirit in our life. Amen. And uh, so I want to keep myself in His love. I want to do His, do His will. I want to, amen, I'm always looking to His mercy. And then it says in verse 22, and on, on some have compassion, making a distinction, but others save with fear, 
pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment defiled by flesh. Amen. Amen. My God. My God. Oh, don't, don't you ever turn up your nose as somebody walks in here that's sinful and whatever sin they're involved in. And some of them again pretty involved in pretty hideous stuff. Don't turn your nose up at them. They can be saved by God. You may hate the lifestyle they're living, but love them. Verse 24, now to him who is also able to keep you from stumbling, hallelujah, and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To God our Savior who alone is wise, be glory and majesty and dominion and power both now and forever. Amen. Amen. So, ladies and gentlemen, we're on the clock. We are on the clock. God is coming. Amen. God is coming. Amen. Uh, our world is facing judgment. Amen. Some of our society said we pour money into it, we get more educated, we become more tolerant of everybody that's going to make a better world. It's not going to make a better world. Man is filled with sin. He's corrupt. He's evil. Amen. Uh, it's just not going to be better. We can do good things and still be evil. Let's stand this morning in this room. But I, I want to be filled with the Holy Ghost. I want to, I, I, I understand, ladies and gentlemen, priority is not your employment. Priority is in my walking with God. <laughs> Hallelujah. Am I doing His will? Am I filled with His Spirit? Or if I have so, ne so much neglected my walk with him. When you, when, you, when you neglect your walk with him, it's very easy to get into evil. Very easy. I mean, that, that's the nature of flesh, to do that which is evil. And if I'm neglecting, amen, the spirit of God in me, and not allowing that spirit to work in me, amen, outside of this building, I'm, uh, I'm capable of anything. But on, in this hour, oh God, pour out your spirit in a great measure. God, bring people to you. Help us to disciple people. Help us to reach people. Help us to impact people. Amen. Because you're coming, God. You're coming. Hallelujah. There's indications of it. Amen. The spirit of God is indicated a long time ago. Amen. When I pour out my spirit, and then in the last days, there's going to be things in the heaven that are all indications of the great day of God. And that great day of God that's coming is not the rapture of the church. That's the judgment of God. Let's reach out to him this morning. Oh, Jesus, we praise you today. We praise you today in this room. My God, we praise you today. Oh, oh. You are wonderful. Bless my pastor. Put your hand upon him. Oh, Jesus, I worship you in this place. I worship you in this house. Help us, God. We're believers in this room. We're believers in this room, God. We're believers. We believe in you today. We believe in you today, God. Help us to follow your spirit, God. Help us to be filled with your spirit, oh God, overflowing in this generation. Help us to know, amen, that you're coming and that we need to help others. We need to disciple people to walk with you. Hallelujah, hallelujah. So help us, God, help us, God. Bless your people today in this room. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Praise God, praise God, praise God. Hallelujah, oh God, oh God. I feel the spirit in the house. Hallelujah, hallelujah. God's spirit's here. This is the day of salvation. Today's the day. Not next week, not next year, but today's the day. Praise God. And we need to hear God today. Hallelujah. God bless you. Amen. We got about seven, eight minutes before we start our morning service. God bless you today. Praise God. Good to, good to be with you this morning.